Well, welcome everyone. We're going to have a beautiful weekend here. It's already begun. And it's beautiful because uh, I feel all of your uh, eagerness and openness and willingness and really that's, that's really your part. When you have that openness and eagerness in your heart, then the answers come and the realizations come and everything comes because it's, that's the will for happiness that all of us share. We share the same will for happiness and we admittedly have looked sometimes in the wrong places for the happiness and that's part of our uh, awakening, you know, we start to realize, oh that, that didn't work and we try something else and that didn't work and yeah, eventually we, we feel like, hmm, I think it should be simple, it should be easy, and it should be intuitive, and it is. It's all those things. Every difficulty melts away in this flow, and many of us were raised with this idea of go with the flow, just relax, trust, follow your heart, be intuitive, go with the flow, yeah, that's it. That, and so we're going to go into that in great detail because sometimes people say, well, yeah, but then this happened, or that happened, or I, I became derailed by this or that. So I thought we would just start off with some music too, because everyone's come in here and music seems to be a way of settling in and sinking in and getting in a real relaxed place of resonance for the, the whole weekend. So there's a couple songs to start us off with. Oh, I'm so honored to be here with all of you. Thank you for, for coming. Thank you for making this happen with Jesus. Um, yeah, the first song I'm going to sing is called Oneness. Um, a year and a half ago I was um, guided to start to play the guitar and then I started receiving a lot of songs. I think it's been like 80, 85 songs now that I have received. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So. There's no earth in 
songs that just dropped in. <laughs> well, we, we want to use this opportunity to just relax and realize we are, we have a beautiful cozy retreat, we're among friends, we're in a beautiful place and we all have this openness and eagerness and willingness to be shown very clearly whatever it is that we feel we need, whatever we're calling for in our heart, that's really the prayer that we're, we're offering up, that it comes to us in a very obvious way. And you may think of this as a, as a dream, like this world is very much like a nighttime dream. It's, for most people, their nighttime dreams are, are a mixed bag, you know, there's some some good ones, and then there's some ones that are not so good, they seem pretty fearful, and there's a lot of mix in between. And yet, it's pretty obvious that when you're sleeping at night and dreaming that your, your mind is just generating this dream. And actually, Sigmund Freud uh, called dreaming wish fulfillment. And so if you think of what seems to be your daily life, your daytime life is wish fulfillment as well. That your mind is very powerful and whatever you're wishing for is getting acted out in your 
life, what seems to be your life as a person in this world. And so, the key with wish fulfillment is if you have if you're wishing for conflicting things, then you get conflicting results in terms of your life, in terms of the dream. And you might say that, that all spiritual awakening is coming down into a purification in your mind where you come so deep within that you actually get to the core root of what you really, truly have always wanted, and we'll call that the wish for happiness. And so when you make it down to the wish for happiness, then your dreams stabilize and you have happy dreams. And in fact, you can't really wake up from this world into, we'll call it reality, just perfect oneness or love or heaven or nirvana. It's called it by different names in different traditions, but but the waking state is just a state of absolute perfection. It's just, it's, you might think of it as totally loving, totally telepathic, and it's so pure and so perfect there's not even a need for words. Uh, the words are part of the invention of this realm. And uh, in this book that I've studied for the last 33 years, it's, Words are called symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. So when we are in relationships and we're trying to work it through with our words, we're using very crude tools. And most of us know there's all these nonverbal communications that, that are sometimes much stronger than the words. We see it on a partner's face. We feel it when we walk in the room. We feel sometimes there's a heaviness or maybe there's a lightness and a joy. But but what we perceive, what we'll call the, the perceptual world, is just ultimately being generated from our mind. And it's a dream world, it's like a motion picture of your mind. And just like a photograph is like a snapshot uh, of a moment in time, the, the world is like a motion picture of your consciousness. So whatever you like about this world, it's coming from your mind, whatever you don't like about this world is coming from your mind. And ultimately, there's a great fear of the unknown because the mind has become so accustomed to dreaming now, and so accustomed to shadow figures, and so familiar with these images that we call the world, and we call our life, that we become quite addicted to the images. And you might say, this purification that we're all going through is starting to loosen up from the attachment and the addiction to the images. So that we can come back to that pure root that I talked about, that wish for happiness. Some traditions, this wish for happiness is called forgiveness. Uh, if you study science and you study quantum physics, uh, the quantum field that the scientists have discovered in quantum physics is, is that wish for happiness. It's everything is completely unified and connected. There's no division in it, there's no separation in the quantum field, there's, there's no distinction between anything else. It's all, it's all like unified energy. And even time and space don't have, even have any effect or play in that because because everything is completely unified, and there's no conflict or disharmony whatsoever. That's the scientific word for the wish for happiness, is the quantum field. And what we'll talk about this weekend is we'll talk about your intuition, we'll talk about guidance, we'll talk about following your heart, we'll talk about becoming clear, uh, that you have we'll say, a function to play that seems to involve time and space that will play out with the body and the world. And yet, actually, if, if I could have one word that I would use as synonymous or the same thing as the function, it is happiness. Your only function is to be happy. It's, it's a definition that is so lifted up from form that you don't even have to try to fill in the blank with, with, with what. 
with what do I need to do to be happy, because it's a state of mind that is completely irrelevant to the form. When you come into your divine purpose, your divine calling, your function, your, uh, it's like the dance. When you come into the dance of spirit, the form becomes completely irrelevant. So, there's no concern whatsoever about the form. There's also no judgment of the form. So, there's not a right and wrong in the dance. There's, there's not uh, good, better, best. There's not, um, there's not a concern about keeping it going, because the dance is everything. And, you know, it's almost like that, uh, what was that Irish dancer that was the Lord of the Dance? Michael Flatley. Michael Flatley, yeah. I used to just go and, and get those out of the library and watch like two hours of Michael Flatley. And all these, uh, I think I'm Facebook friends with his sister Annie, Annie Flatley now, but she, they, they, I would just watch them dance, and these athletes just in harmony and synchronization, just dancing with lights flashing on the stage, and I could just watch one show after the next after the next, because it was like a meditation of joy for me to watch all of them in such synchronicity. And as you give yourself over to this function of happiness, you start to also realize that everything is obvious, everything is easy, everything uh, comes freely. Uh, struggle is not part of the dance. You find that um, worry, concern, guilt, fear, none of those emotions are part of this unified dance of happiness. That all of those emotions were coming from this sense of an ego or a sense of a separate self, and trying to maintain a separate identity apart from the dance. That's where the, the struggle comes in. That's where the fatigue comes in. Whenever we get tired, we just have a strain of judgment going on, like constant judgment in our mind, and it's become such an addiction that we feel we can't, we can't stop it. Uh, Sometimes, I've been traveling for like the last 30 years around the world and 44 countries and one of the questions that I get pretty frequently is, how do I stop judging in my mind? And I say, well, trying to stop judging is like trying to stop a runaway freight train that is going down a mountain. You, you can't stop it, but you can move into a state of mind that is prior to it. There's actually a state of mind, a state of being, that exists prior to this state of judgment. And it's what Jesus talked about in the Bible. He said, before Abraham was, I am. He was talking about the I am presence. This state of mind that's pristine, that's perfect, that's actually reality, that's prior to this dream state of uh, what seems to be constant judgment. And, and so if you can't stop a runaway freight train, then, then actually what is it that we're, we're going to do? How, how do I approach this state of mind if I can't stop the judgment? And in the Course in Miracles it says that you need to follow a judgment that comes through you, but is not by you. In other words, that's what the guidance is. It still tells you where to go, what to do, it still may say, call so-and-so, write to so-and-so. Um, it still involves communication symbols, it still involves all the dream uh, figures, and it still involves all the dream symbols. So you're not trying to just kind of like click your heels and twinkle your nose and say, get me out of here. You know, you're actually tuning in to what is it that would be most helpful, and then you start to receive these impressions, or these guidances, these words, these little inner, inner nudges that we've all felt, these little inner promptings, they may not even be, make any rational sense when you get a little inner nudge sometime. You may have another voice in your mind that's going, that's ridiculous, that's a waste of time, don't be silly, 
you know, it's, it's, it's very critical and condemning, that's the ego. But those little nudges are extremely important because you can learn to just follow those nudges all the time. And that's what we, we call a guided life. So this weekend, from all of us who have arrived here too, from, from Francis and myself, from Svava, from Jeffrey, we, will, we are totally an open book. You can ask us any question at all. There's no uh, embarrassing questions, there's no questions that are off limits. Uh, you can ask absolutely any question of us about our journeys, about um, some of our experiences we've had, questions that seem to be very practical about how does this work for you guys in terms of, of your daily living. Um, questions about prayer, questions about guidance, questions about, you know, how do you f handle finances, um, diet, nutrition, exercise. I mean, you can ask us if we have certain kind of rituals or um, programs that, that we use or have used. So it's just like it's, we are totally 100% available and I was saying just a little while ago today, I said there's nothing more fun for me than to come together in a beautiful setting like this with a group of friends who, who have this eagerness and openness and willingness. This to me is my version of, of joy. Uh, because we come together wanting the same thing and the Spirit is with us and then it's fun always for me to see what happens. Sometimes we end up watching movies. We, some of you did uh, join us, was it Wednesday, we had uh, Take Me Home. Um, sometimes we've watched movies or movie clips. Sometimes we've, we've used, we use a lot of music, we use meditation, we use quiet times. We, we have lively discussions that, that can go on and on and on, and have gone on and on for, for me, <laughs> like 30, 30 years. It's, I was saying the other day, I, I went to California one time and I was doing a series of gatherings, I call them uh, mealtime gatherings. So we would all meet, a group of friends would all meet, we would meet, go to breakfast and then they'd chase us out of there, we'd go to another place for lunch and then we'd go to another place for dinner and we would just have an ongoing, like the ancient Greeks, you know, sitting around in the pools, we would just go from restaurant to restaurant to restaurant or sometimes from cafe to cafe to cafe, you know, order a different drink each, each place, but we would just, literally the sun would come up and go down. And that's pretty much how my whole life has gone, for the, at least for the last 30 years, it's been traveling all over the world and, and having these spontaneous gatherings where anything can be asked, any topic can be raised, and we, we launch into it. Uh, on the Wednesday gathering, you were asking about marriage, how... And I said, we could end up with a whole retreat with that one. You can, you can, that is like a can of worms, you know. You can go into the topic of marriage so deeply that you end up on talking about guidance, and you get talking about your calling. You know, it all comes to the same place, no matter whether you're starting a business, whether you're contemplating marriage, whether you're contemplating relationships, whether you're, you want to talk about physics or quantum physics, I, it doesn't matter which way we come from. We don't have to come through religion, we can come through quantum physics. We can, we can come through your daily living experiences and what you've learned, like insights you've had and inspirations you've had. We can start with those and we, we always end up in the same place, no matter where we start. And we also are very prayerful with these retreats, so we, we don't really have them planned out. You know, we, we have, I guess we have a, do we have movies? We have a hard drive with how many movies? Oh, the whole night. Two, two and a half terabytes. We have two and a half terabytes of movies. And that includes all kinds of movies on all kinds of topics. And I even, lately, I, there's a lot of them we call quantum movies. We were talking the other day, and out of all the movies you've ever seen, you were saying Mr. Nobody yeah. was the movie of choice for you to, like, mm. 
spring your mind beyond this world. There was, uh, years ago when I was traveling around the world, people would ask me, they would say, if there's just, you have to boil it down. This was before Mr. Nobody even came around, but they would say, is there just one movie that I could watch that you would recommend? Like if I was, I was on a desert island and I, and I was, only had one, one few more hours to live and I could just watch one movie. What one movie would you pick for me to watch right before, it's, my, it's like my last right, my last movie. And at that time it was uh, George Clooney and it was the movie Solaris. So I would say if you had one movie choice, go watch Solaris. Probably too it's best to watch it with my commentary because that way you're sure to spring into a, a happy, enlightened state with the right commentary. Solaris. I don't, you know what it's called down here? Solaris. 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 <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, solar is like light, and is is solar is, light is. So really you can look at the translation of Solaris is light is. Which that's the truth. Light is. And then this movie kind of takes you into the deep, like, uh, mm. as you sow, so shall you reap. You know, that the power of the mind is, is used in this movie so that you have to come to a surrender point of, of letting go of everything you think you know and surrender into that light. Uh, and that's part of what we'll talk about this weekend. So movies are another thing. We still have the option, we have, we have Take Me Home, so I think some of you saw that on Wednesday, maybe half of you saw, saw that it. On Wednesday. Okay, so some of you have seen okay. it. There's more people that have seen it. Have? Maybe. Six, six have not. Six have not. Okay, so that's another possibility, is that movie, because every time you watch it, it is, it's, it's, a, you, it's a new one, like Jeffrey's saying every time. Every time he sees it, he sees, has a whole different experience and everything, so that's a possibility. And the other thing, I think, I feel like a lot of you are at turning points in one way or another in your life or with different things that have come upon you and now there's, there's maybe even a sense of a little bit of a, an urgency in your, in your mind because you're starting to reach some crossroads. And I've done retreats with people, uh, I've been doing, the longest retreats I usually do are like, people come with me and they're together with me for six weeks. So this is a, this is a mini, mini, mini. But we will watch a lot of movies over those six weeks and have, we kind of go into things so deeply that that usually in the last few days of those six weeks, the people will come and they will say, I can't even think of, of a life to go back to. Like, I can't, I know I've got a plane ticket, but my mind is in such a different place from being with you for those six weeks that I don't even know what I'm going to find when I go back. I'm going to take the plane ticket, but my perception has shifted so radically We've even had, one woman came when we were in Spain, she came diagnosed with cancer coming in and in total, complete remission, leaving the six weeks. So that was her presenting issue, was cancer. She came in with it, she gave herself totally over to a transformation of consciousness and she came out the other end in total remission from the cancer. Others will say, I don't know if I can even speak speak and tell anybody about the experience I've had, but but it's important. And I, I say, yeah, I think I think you should, a group of you should make a Facebook group and you should communicate with each other because you are going through similar things now after those six weeks and that will help it continue on if you just keep communicating with each other. So it's almost like they have a new family, the, the ones who have just gone through the transformation together and then they communicate to where their fears are, where their doubts are, where they're still struggling and they still seem to be stuck. And and for us too, this is like, this is so
so important to us that this is not a profession, this is not something we do on the side. This is our life. We give ourselves over to this 24-7. We're just in this moment of, of devotion to the One, to the One Spirit in such a deep way that it's, it can be very, very spontaneous and if there are seeming plans to be made, we are told of those. It's, it, it becomes much more telepathic, so you have a very strong prayer life and you become more telepathic, but there's just not, there's not really as much of a, of a heavy emphasis on the words even, the more you come to this experience of one-mindedness, because it's uh, it's like that song Paul McCartney and Wings did, Don't ever ask me why I never say goodbye to my love. It's understood. It's in the hands of my love. And my love does it good. It's a beautiful line from Paul McCartney of that communion kind of experience where there's so much love and connection and then we also have enormous transparency in our lives with we talked about no private thoughts and no people pleasing, so it, it keeps the space clean in the mind when we are so open about our, our thoughts, our emotions, our guidances, uh, those little nudges, we're talking about those all the time. It's not like a rare thing, I got a nudge. When? Last night. <laughs> you know, no, we, we usually talk about the nudge immediately if we start to get a prompt or a nudge and then yeah we can we can all feel it. <laughs> Are you demonstrating a nudge? Yeah, What's a nudge? Kick it, uh, she asked me yeah. the nudge. So that yeah, is like, it's like <laughs> Yeah, it's like a little a little message. Yeah. It's like the way they get the guidance. It's like uh, inside. It's a prompt or a nudge. Yeah. 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 It's the, yeah. the guidance. Usually it's inside, although there are sometimes a lot of signs, we, we will say, did you see that? Because it's such an outer pattern kind of sign. Uh, but right before we started I was thinking of the, Madonna did a, an album a while back called Ray of Light. And one of her songs starts off, traveling down the road, watching the signs as I go. That's puts a line in the song. That's pretty much what we do, is we travel down the road, we watch the signs as we go, and we stay in full communication about those signs. And we laugh a lot, you know. I mean, one time I, I was just reminded, because we went to Mexico City, and I was reminded that six of us hopped in a van, we, we drove for about, Jeffrey was in the van, we drove, it's fine, we drove for about six hours, six or seven hours from from uh, Chapala, where we were living in Mexico, in the van to into Mexico City. And we found ourselves in the middle of this massive city. We were in a loop, like that movie Groundhog Day, you know, where the weatherman keeps going. We were in a, some kind of a traffic loop where we kept going around and and we would go around and we would go and go and then the, we, we seemed to not be able to get out of the loop. We were just going completely in circles. For how long was that going on? Five or six loops. <laughs> five or six loops. Were, we were. There were fifteen minute loops. <laughs> there were fifteen minutes loops, and we were in there, and we're like, we're in some kind of a loop. And then I remember saying, oh, I remember there was a Star Trek episode where they were caught in a, one of these loops, and they had to have data in the next next generation Star Trek, the android data to pay close attention in the loop to see uh, if there were any clues. And then we started to get the feeling like, okay, let's look, we're all going to look for the clues, because we couldn't, we, we just kept making the same turns and there didn't seem to be any exit. We could find no exit out of the loop, so we kept looping around, looping around, and then finally we uh, were told, wasn't it by one of the... We asked someone. We told asked us. someone, and they said, you need to look for some people that are wearing blue uniforms <laughs> off on the side, and you need to go and pay them some money in blue uniforms, and we're all like, 
cool, okay. <laughs> and so we were, that's like all we were told. If you pay these people in blue uniforms some money, they'll give you... The right thing. It was like a ticket. No, it's kind of a box. It was a it's box. A treasure hunt. <laughs> it was like a, some kind of a box or something. You get don't, you get the box and that will get you out of it. Sounds like something you watch in a movie. And then we went around and we were back in the loop again and we we're coming right to the point. It looks like we're going to loop one more time and we're like, come on, we're all looking at each other like up with the blue. The people dressed in blue. Where are the people dressed in blue? And then I look back. Over my shoulder, I said, they're back there, we passed them. <laughs> oh, and then we went up, they said, you have to go. One <laughs> more <laughs> We had to go up around. <laughs> we missed them. We, they were dressed in blue back there, but we missed them. And so we didn't get the box, and therefore we didn't get, but we finally did get out. But we were having a lot of laughter as we were looping. In, and I know a lot of you can relate to that with relationships, where you feel you're in a looping relationship pattern, and you have no clue uh, how you're going to get out of this loop, but you're praying that there is a way out. And then, <laughs> that's right. The spirit's having fun. I am the man in blue, <laughs> and I do not have a box for you, but <laughs> something may be better than a box. Well, what about the box? What, what did you have? The box. <laughs> <laughs> You're in blue too. <laughs> but what about the box? I am curious. What? What did you? They never got the box. They never got the box. It was actually some kind of electronic thing. When we came up to the toll, there was three ways you could go, but all three ways brought us back the same way. Finally, when we purchased this Mexico City toll thing, uh, it got us through a different way. Uh, it, was like so it was an electronic box that we had to purchase to get out of this loop. Yeah, I don't even know how many pesos it cost. We were happy because we were we were going south to do a gathering at Postland, which is south, I think of. Um, so we had to we had to go out of there, but we did get it. So I think that's a key to it too, because being creatures of habit, a lot we start to realize that that the the loops that we make, we seem to make them in form, but actually it's not the form that is the loop, but we have certain beliefs about time even. We believe things about time, and therefore, like I said, the world is a motion picture of everything you believe. So if you believe in time, uh, then that belief itself will send you on the, the loops. Sometimes they call it reincarnation, sometimes they call it these karmic loops, depending on what you've read and studied in philosophies. But basically time itself is an invention, and all dreams are based on this belief in time. And time is not a belief that will get you to the happiness. It's almost like if you were playing like a, a board game, Monopoly or one of those board games, and you know you you kept coming around to park place and and boardwalk and uh, you look at all these things and you go around and around but but time will not actually get you off of the out of the dream time keeps you in the dream and think of it for a minute eternity is there is no time in eternity so the purpose is to wake up to our eternal nature with just absolute pure love. And time is one of those things that as long as we are invested in time, as long as we want time, as long as we believe that time serves us in some way that we're not sure about, then we still have a belief in the value of time. So you might say the spiritual awakening is starting to have that value of time loosen from your mind, so that you come more into a desire for eternity, a desire for the present moment is the gateway to eternity. How can we become so present, so fully present, that we don't have any regrets from the past anymore, we don't have any worries or concerns for the future? We literally escape from time by being fully present. 
and of course Eckhart Tolle and, and many, many great sages and mystics, have, saints have been talking about this present moment. And so that's what we really go, go for. How can you actually live your life where the focus is not on the past or the future? And we come back to our intuition and the guidance. That's why the guidance is so important. You actually need to be intuitively guided in order to stay present. Because without that intuitive guidance, then it's like this ego voice in your mind is always saying, you're not enough, you, you aren't enough, you haven't done enough, you, you need to achieve, you need to accomplish, you need to prove something to someone, you need to, you need to somehow make your way. And this is more of a path of surrender, where you don't try to make your way to eternity. You, you like surrender over to the flow. Like say, I would rather be a twig in the river than have a speedboat. I would rather, I would rather be a twig in the river than, than learn how to do the backstroke in the river. I, I, I would rather be carried by the river to the ocean and just happily go and spill out into the ocean and merge with with everything that is, instead of trying to maintain this separate, autonomous, independent mask of being a, a, an individual. So I think another thing you may want to ask us about too is, is also uh, how, how we have lived our lives, because in terms of um, uh, like um, different things, like Svava has um, two boys, twin boys, and and she was raising her boys and raising them till they were about 15, 15 years old. And then she got this huge, more than a nudge, this huge calling into remembering everything that is. And maybe you could just share about the, the that, uh, what happened to you when you were having a prayerful day and you lit all these candles in your room and you were waiting to be shown guidance and, and you have these two twins that are 15 mm. years old, maybe you can share what happened, because I think that was helpful. Should I use? You can use that. Yes. Yeah, I, um, I actually had been to a retreat with David in Holland and Francis was there too. And uh, I was living at that time in Copenhagen, and I went back to Copenhagen, and I had this uh, huge feeling of um, that I would not live in Denmark anymore, that something was going to change, but I couldn't really figure it out in my mind, how is that going to work? And I was praying to Jesus to make it obvious for me, and um, I had lit candles all over my living room in my apartment and I was blowing them out because I was going to bed and uh, one of the candles slipped out of my hand and the wax uh, ran over a photograph of me in the middle and my sons and the wax just ran only over me, deleted me out of the photo and then I heard in my mind how does this feel? And something just happened in my heart. It was like this huge expansion. And I feel, felt this universal love for them and for like everyone, for everything. And, uh, and I heard, uh, job well done. I felt like my role as being a mom was done and uh, that I had a calling for, for something else. But it, it was so peaceful, it was so, it felt so, so right, and it felt so loving, um, and I felt so, so taken care of that I didn't have to figure anything out myself. Um, and uh, after that I said to Jesus, you have to show me and tell me how to tell the boys that I was going to be going. And... Uh, and one evening we were sitting at the dinner table and it just came out of my mouth that I felt this calling that I had to follow. Um, and they were like, Mom, you've got to do it. You have to follow your heart. You always told us to follow our hearts. And it was so, everything was so easy. 
it was I was just in shock. I thought it would be so complicated, and I had to do something myself. But it was all taken care of. Um, I had two cats too, and my parents said we we would love to take your cats, and just it was very very quick that I unwinded from everything. Only four months, I think, since yeah, and then I uh, let go of my apartment I was renting and sold all my things and my sons are living with my ex and it was all like taken care of and then I um, with one suitcase I went to the center in Mexico and that was yeah that was uh, three years ago that I that I left yeah so yeah thank you thank you yeah it's it's Important to remember that when you get these guidances and nudges, it's it's for happiness, but it's for the happiness of the whole universe. Like this, it's almost like if you were in a labyrinth or a maze, and your part is to be lifted out of the maze to reach a state of mind where you're on high, and you can look at the whole maze, the whole, and go, "Wow, amazing!" But but you can feel like it's for the whole universe. It's not for one or the other, like there, you were telling me too about how there, earlier in her life that she had gotten into a court battle over custody of the children for six years, and then here comes the wax. Jesus, what do you want me to do? You're out now. <laughs> Your turn is done. <laughs> I've got a use for you, and and that was pretty obvious when you were just deleted from the. Yeah. from the photograph. Yeah. And now the the boys are, they just turned 18, she met with them recently, one his girlfriend, and and it was very beautiful joining you had with them because they were very, you might say they were very wise, very mature 15 year olds too, you know how each case is different, but they were very mature and that was probably a big part of them saying, you need to go for this, you've always told us to follow our hearts, now you have to follow yours. So it wasn't like a giant separation anxiety, it was one of those orchestrated things. But it just is a good extreme example too, because you can have beliefs in your mind around children and, and lots of things, including time and all kinds of responsibilities and duties, but as I was talking about at the gathering uh, around responsibility, if if you're going to go for this happiness that that I would say is happy for no earthly reason, it's just happy because of, that's your natural state of mind. You were created happy, and when you go into unhappiness, it's it's going off into ego, it's going off into thoughts and beliefs that really don't belong in your holy mind. That we were created holy we were created holy because we come from holiness. We were created happy because we come from happiness. We were created loving because we come from love. We were created eternal because we come from an eternal being, an eternal source. So to get all caught up in dreams and all the stresses and worries and concerns of the dream world is really arrogant. When you think of it, if you are created happy, and now you've you've taken yourself off into sometimes happy, sometimes not, that really is not natural. You you might say that everyone's concerned about hell. Uh, some of these fire and brimstone, heaven and hell kind of religions and philosophies. No, the time and space. This is as bad as it gets. Uh, there is no eternal fire and damnation. You know, if you do the wrong things, you you go, there is no thing like this. The struggles you go through in this world, the, the temptations, the difficulties, the conflicts, those are the state of hell. That's the state of not knowing the eternal happiness that you were created to be. So, you don't have to worry about going to hell. It's like you're asking for the escape from hell. You have to come to an admission that unless I'm perfectly happy now, and consistently happy, then it must mean that my mind believes to some extent in hell. 
uh, just by the by the way I feel. You know that you don't even have to try to figure it out theologically. It's like it's not perfect happiness. When Francis first, when we first met, you you did say that that was the thing when I, when you came to a talk. I think it was down in Sydney and. Francis was, as usual, a bit skeptical and like, yeah, well, I'll go and I'll, I'll just stand in the back of the room so I can, I'm by the door so I can get out. If this guy starts talking and he's crazy, he's Looney Tunes, then I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be in the back of the room so I can just slide right out. But then she heard me he mention something about that I hadn't had a bad day in 20 years and that got her attention. But she, she was more like, I'm going to check this guy out even more now. <laughs> Anybody who says they haven't had a bed in 20 years. And so you, that was part of what got you into this. Yeah. And then I think you did a week-long retreat, and then that was like game-changer yeah. for the whole thing. Yeah, I think at that point, um, I, I was already um, at a point of... I think one day in Sydney, I was walking, and I realized I had never been happy in my life. And it was such a, a shock, shocking realization, because I had a lot of, you know, like I achieved a lot of goals that I set for myself. I had a very strong and clear direction for my life, I achieved all of them. But I, that moment, I just look back and I thought I had never been happy in my life and it was such a sad moment and but from that point on there was some kind of like even I was, I was not you know uh, brought up as um, religious or spiritual at all so it was just a complete blocked out of anything that that around the realm of happiness. It was goal-oriented. It was very, very driven, success, um, tangible. Education, possession. Education, possession, materialistic, and uh, money, but also, uh, you know, different goals. Relationship needs to be this way and this kind of pattern. And, and just, like, very clear where my life is heading and all the things that can bring me happiness. I had a goal for that. But when I realized I had never been happy, I was really sad that day. But not long after that, that's why when um, I got into the course, it was very uplifting for me. I started a Course in Miracles group in Sydney, and I was the first one who started Course in Miracles meetup group. Um, that was about 13 years ago. So, so it would, the group grew so big straight away. And from the second meeting, the people who came to my group said, you have to check this guy from America called David Hofmeister out. I thought, no, I'm not checking a teacher who claimed to be a teacher. <laughs> this is something I, I need to find my happiness. You know, I'm, I'm done studying now. This is a book about happiness. That's what I'm, I'm here for. Then... Then when I met David, it was because um, someone in my group was hosting a retreat like this and want me to advertise on my website. And I said, I, in order to advertise, I have to check him out to see whether I, I can feel what I'm advertising is authentic. So that's when I went to a two-hour talk in Sydney. And it was really mind-blowing because not only because of what you said, that I hadn't had a bad day in 20 years, but it was the, the happiness that I saw, I witnessed, was so real to me. And I thought, how can any, is that even possible to say that? That is possible on this planet Earth to not have a bad day ever. Is this happiness even exist at all? So that was definitely, like, that caught my attention. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah how many years ago was that? that was uh, uh, 10, 11, 10 years 11 years ago yeah but then um, I think I was at a point of you know I had a financial business and uh, like into financial planning and um, I was a broker and 
and had a, a, a marriage partner, my, my husband, ex-husband. So everything was kind of just doing, going through the motions. There was no real spark and joy. And I thought, okay, I'm just going through the motions day in and day out, day in and day out, until I met David and I went to a week-long retreat. And something happened, profoundly happened. I was, that was the retreat I, I told you that I, I first opened up to share all my thoughts, and all these bottled up feelings and emotions that I was not able to share with anybody. So when I shared, there was some kind of transformation that happened. And after that, I said, I, I want to live like this for the rest of my life. And there is no reason... If, if this is possible, there's no reason for me to go back to unhappiness anymore. And that was a very ambitious goal, and I'm very ambitious, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's an ambitious goal to be happy and never, never slip back to sometimes partial happiness or not. And um, at the time, I just felt, okay, now... I'm done. I wrapped up my life in, in Sydney, Australia, and I moved to the monastery in Utah, in America. And that's the... I've been there for the past 10 years, like past decade. But I realized that this goal of happiness is so different than the goal in any other goals that I had in my life because it's not a goal that I can achieve by my effort. And it's not a goal that I can achieve by learning, by accumulating knowledge anymore. So I remember when I first arrived at the monastery, I so wanted to prove that I'm worthy to be here. And they say, okay, we have a lot of projects. And what do you want to do? I said, I can, you know, I can do um, something finance related. I can do your accounting if you want me to as long as I'm not in physical projects. That's one thing I don't want to do. And they said, no, we, we only need some, someone to paint the building <laughs> and to clean the, the bathrooms. <laughs> so I was like, oh, this is, this is very hard to start with. And then one day, um, Lisa in the monastery, we, we crossed paths. I was carrying this ba- basket of water with mob and all the things, the cleaning equipment. And I was pretty angry. And she's like, how are you doing, Francis? I said, I'm working. So I just bypassed her. And then she, 20 minutes, she came back to me and she said, what's your work? So I thought, oh, that's right. Why am I here? Why am I giving up all of that to be here? Let me not waste my time to just get things done again. You know, okay, I'm in a monastery by choice. I'm here. My work is to watch my mind. My, my work is really to see all these thoughts and all these beliefs that brings me pain. So that was a, a moment just to call, call back this attention, to, to just remember why you're doing anything anymore. And I would say that that was the beginning of of a life that I'm living right now, I'm very, very conscious of what I'm doing anything for, and I'm doing absolutely everything for the purpose to accept the, the will of, of this um, happiness, to bring me back to happiness, and to watch my mind that if there's any block to block that, so isn't it interesting too because when we talked about it years later we I do remember that that uh, the actor Jim Carrey uh, has said on on film he said I wish everybody lots of success so that they would know that success is not happiness they said he said I just wish everybody could have just as much success as I've had so they could know that this is is not it because I think that's like a time saver from somebody who's been in all those movies, an actor, famous, people love to be around him, funny, you know, all those things. 
and and he's he attained so many things and and actually Francis I guess it could be said that in terms of like with with your un university and scholarship and a bright student and then you know you have the husband you have a couple houses you have a successful business you know by most people's standards in this world of, of seeming scarcity and lack that you had achieved a great deal of success and then to feel unhappy and sad after having gone through all that like you ring the bell you hit all the things that you're supposed to many people in the world are just chasing after something and not realizing that you get to a certain point and then there's a disillusionment there's a heartbreak like oh my gosh is there more like that Peggy Lee song is that all there is is that all there is my friend you know that's a very famous song but we did have a talk one time too where you said well even though I was successful and everything I was kind of thinking that that's why I was trying to be so successful because we we talked where you said be financially set so that I can travel around the world I can meet people I can go see wonderful places I can all these things she started sharing was what she's doing now and this was actually some some years ago a few years ago we were talking everything that she's doing that she was trying to earn her way into came when she let go of trying to earn her way into it it all came in the most glorious miraculous ways and then you were saying wow everything that I really was aiming for seemed to come from to me but it wasn't through career relationship accumulation portfolio you know all the things they tell us that you, you'd have to do that well, I had the same experience that you had, uh, you know, so I was young too, and I used to watch uh, David uh, on, on YouTube and, and I read. And I, kept, and I said, I don't know how many times I said, when I grow up, I want to be exactly like that guy. Huh? Because he was so happy all the time, and smiling, and I mean, and, and you know, of course, of course I'm a student, and I mean, so I want to be like him. But just you know, you're pointing here to, to, to a question that I think it's, it's interesting for everyone, right? So what you did, you, you, you at some point, you said, I'm going to change my purpose, I'm going to change my mindset up, or something like that. But how long did it take you to, uh, to become happy? Well, um, it's, it's kind of like a gradual. Uh, the happiness right now is consistent. You know, it's like you don't want... But you still have to do some forgiveness uh, yourself, right? Oh, yeah. You have to clear your, your mind. Yeah, because um, also, apart from the, the realization I, I've never been happy, um, at that point, I was always, also, because I was so driven in life, very fast-paced life, I had uh, a very poor health. I, I had so much pain in my physical body in my early 20s and late or mid-20s that I felt like I was going to die in my 40s. That's, that's the kind of feeling I have because the body was just falling apart because there was also emotional uh, like push away. I'm not in touch with my emotions. Just go, go, go. And then, um, so basically when I let everything go, it was a sincere desire to just almost like a let's let's restart because I I didn't know how to be happy I did not know how to even have anything together anymore so I'm gonna be willing to be guided and I'm going to do it differently with the two guidelines that the monastery had was my initial guideline that's all I needed to know no private thoughts I I was someone who was very private. I hold all my secrets. I did not want to share my thoughts. I know people pleasing. I was a big people pleaser. So, okay, I thought, okay, I have two guidelines and let me just go there. I don't even need to know too much else. So living in a monastery with a group of people and every single day, all we did was to have lunchtime expressions. 
and to share what was coming up. And the, the sharing wasn't so much about my past life, what I had with my ex-husband or what brought me here. It's not that kind of sharing. It was what was coming up in the moment. Because when we live with a group of people in a community working on projects, all the issues I had with my mother and my father and my ex-husband all came up right in front of me anyways. They're not different issues. So they are coming up. And for for us, the, the private thoughts are, the habit was still there to hold it in, to process on my own and not to... But the difference was that you're doing all of that over there always. Always. With your, with your mind set up to say, my objective is to be happy. So you have exactly. that idea very, very clear in your mind. Very clear. I, I think mean, I would I say want to be happy, and uh, you know, that, that's why I'm doing all that. Yeah. And I do feel like it's, it's um, deep down, you know, um, we want freedom. To me, happiness and freedom are the same, same kind of word. It's happiness is not just excitement. I have an excitement momentary excitement it's it's a state of mind of course, yes. and freedom to me is a state of mind so I want to be free from my own thoughts my own sufferings my own negative thinking so that's basically what we're we're living together for I know but how long did it take you from the beginning until you achieved <laughs> number of ways <laughs> <you're at least. laughs> hours precisely how long, how long did it take for you to become happy <laughs> well how long I would say every time I forgave I became happy and I realized forgiveness just bring this total happiness to me in that moment. It was so total. And then gradually, the, the linear time actually started to mean less and less. And I would say I, I didn't have a moment of time saying, oh, my, by now I'm completely happy now. But it's a gradual because situation brings up things. And if there, is a, if there are still thoughts and past references then it's moment to forgive, and in that moment, I'm completely, it's complete, the happiness is complete. So I would say it's almost like um, a, a lighthouse, it sweeps. At first it sweeps, and then you can, you do whatever you can do, you forgive whatever you forgive, but it keeps sweeping until the moment that there's nothing left anymore. So... And I was talking... We were talking, Louis was talking, and a friend of ours, Antonio, had come over and, and was, he was like saying, I've got it figured out now, like the whole thing, I've got it all figured out, like, like enlightenment is like, like, almost like an algorithm, like, a, you know, like they have the Google algorithm, so you have to figure out how they ranked, uh, like an enlightenment algorithm, and, and yet, it, it never is anything that that we can imagine. If somebody had told me back in my 20s, I think I was about 27 years old when A Course in Miracles, this amazing tool, came into my life. And I just finished 10 years of university. Uh, and then this book comes in, that's written in, psych it's in English, but it's in psychological terms, Christian terms, and educational terms. Well, I was raised Christian, I was studied psychology in undergrad and grad, and and I was in school, university for ten years. That's on top of high school, kindergarten. You know, that was there was twenty some years of education. So it's it literally came in English and in the the language, in the vernacular, in the vocabulary that I was familiar with, almost like an answer to a prayer, like here. And as soon as it landed, for me, it was like, I've got no excuses now. Like, this is, I really have no excuses. I can't complain that I, you didn't show me the way, you know, as if God was up there somewhere and I could shake my fist and say, you weren't specific enough. You didn't give me the right people, the right book. And I was like, ah, yipes. I've got no excuses now. But actually, I think... Part of what we share as we've been going around sharing Take Me Home, the movie, is that as some of you were there, Francis was saying, Francis 
is not a movie maker, got a dream six years before the movie began uh, that she would be making a movie. She was told the movie had already happened, don't worry about when it will come, it's already over, you're just going to go through it. Imagine that somebody told you that spiritual awakening was like that, that it would be nothing like you ever imagined based on your past learning. Like, whatever you think it is, it's not that. Uh, however convinced and certain you are it's going to be a certain way, it's not going to be anything like that. And if somebody had showed me a motion picture of the way that the parable of David played out from like 27 to 61, I would have either just laughed in disbelief and go, where did you get this crazy footage? And that, that is a real movie you got there, but that is not realistic. Or I would have been frightened if I'd have seen the movie. I would have seen all these travels and all this. I would have just been shocked because I was very shy and very introverted at the time. When, if I'd been seeing that movie, I would have been, probably been very frightened. Like, oh, what is this, a nightmare? You're telling me this is my life, my future life to happiness and it looks like a nightmare to me. But the thing is, that that's, that's part of what we want to share with you from our experiences. Stava, myself, Francis, Jeffrey, is that things have turned out in ways vastly different, seemingly turned out, if there is such a thing as turned out, but things are looking in appearances very, very, very different. You know, Jeffrey, a couple of years ago, I don't think, a few years ago, you weren't contemplating getting married. And then this marriage comes in, like you were asking about marriage. This was like an, a spiritually arranged marriage, uh, not like an Indian arranged marriage with dowry and you know, and <laughs> the parents and everything, but we're talking about a, a high. And, and all of us can share with you that the, the direction our lives seem to play out in appearances has been nothing like we ever imagined. We weren't like vision boarding you know, like with Joe Dispenza, you know, okay, let's do, let's draw it up, and we'll travel the world, and we'll do, you'll make a movie, you'll get married, you'll leave your children, you know. If somebody would have come to us and told us the way that this is played out, we all of us would have gone, you are cracked. You, there is no way in a zillion years that it's going to go that way. Or that we'd be down in Brazil doing a birthday party weekend retreat, <laughs> you know, in the jungle. No, you know, there's just no way. <laughs> you, we would never have even come close to it, but that's what we want to talk about. Even in the making of the movie, uh, there's been so many miracles, and miracle after miracle, but there's, even as it went on from one year, two years, editing process and everything, there were so many things that came up that in order to, we'll say, to stay happy, it took a huge letting go, a huge surrender. So much of a letting go that it's like, I don't know if this is even meant to be made as a movie. You actually reached those points where you were, had taken the hands off of the whole thing. There wasn't even that thing driving in there, like, gotta get it finished. I'll be a failure if I, if I go through all this and I don't have a movie. There was even, you had to let go of that. And I think we would say that for all of us, that that's, that's to follow your intuition requires you to allow all this stuff to come up from your unconscious mind. Your shoulda, woulda, couldas. You ought to be doing this. Oh, a good girl does this, a good boy does this. All the conditioning, all the programming you're going to have to have a lot of willingness to let, say, oh yeah, Ali Ali income free, like it's a, a childhood game. Come on, unconscious mind, what do you got down there? Hit me with your best shot. Day after day, let it come. I'll face it. I'll face whatever feelings are there. I'll face whatever ambitions are still going on down there, whatever goals. And isn't that what Buddha talked about, about emptying your mind? Isn't that what Jesus talks about? If you look at all the saints, old contemporary saints, you know, Eckhart is saying, empty your mind, come back to the present moment. You know, it's the same message, and yet we want to share our experiences that will give you a little bit of, of an idea that it is possible, and you do have to be very 
persistent, very thorough. You have to, to give your mind's effort towards letting go and surrendering in a huge way, more than maybe you, you ever thought you were even capable of. Because we didn't know we had, we really couldn't tell for sure that we had that power underneath it, that our mind was that powerful. But through studying the Course, through discussions, through like expression sessions, lots of tears. I know I went through a period, I think in my 20s, I think it started in my, my late teens all the way into my 20s where there was so many tears. You know, down here in South America you have Iguazu mm -hmm. Falls. That's how my emotions felt. I thought, I'm shy, I'm introverted. I don't even know. I didn't even know that there was that many tears in there. I didn't know my tear ducts were capable of Iguazu. But actually, I went into a phase where the tears came so strong on a daily basis that in my 20s, I just, I thought, how can people function? How can people go to work or university with so much? You can't just be crying that all day. That was before the course. That was before the course, yeah. I had a dog, Chipper my dog, who would just sit there for hours. I mean, if you t totaled it up, it was hundreds, thousands of hours of licking my face. And that was my psychotherapy. Chipper didn't charge by the hour. You know, just the tail wagging and the pink tongue treatment for hours upon hours upon end. But I think that was very important for me in the spiritual awakening, was to emote that much. And then having this pink tongue licking me was like a symbol of it's okay, keep it coming. Like, don't, you don't need to shut it off for me. In fact, when I think Chipper, when she saw the tears, she just had this great empathy, like, oh, I love you. And the more I would cry, the more the pink tongue would come out. So it was a very loving response to all that dark emotion. And, and I thought, I would, I would hear a song, I, cry me a river. I thought, I'm crying an ocean here. I mean, this is, this is judgments, this is dysfunctional, who cries in the basement. I didn't do it so much, out so much in the world. I would just go down there and spend a lot of hours crying in the basement uh, with the dog down there. And, but for all of us, we all have to face, I think we have all can say we faced that we had a lot of emotions to come up. And we all dealt with it in different ways, um, you know, because that's just the way it works. You do the best that you can do to deal with these heavy emotions. Svava can share that she she was over in uh, in Denmark, but but she had been raised in Iceland and she loved Iceland. It was very mysterious and mystical and enchanted, and and she did go through some dark times. But basically, she adored Iceland, and her parents said. We're just going over to Europe, to Denmark, for one year. And that one year just kept extending on. She, she never did get really to go back there to live. So there was like a heartbreak there. But also then, like with many people, prescription drugs, getting, you know, the system where you get bounced around from one department to the next, taking lots of prescription drugs and, you know, like you're a problem and you've been diagnosed and you're not functional, you can't work in the world and you have to kind of play the game to get your money from the government. You know, she went deep into that, playing the game with the government um, to because you're a dysfunctional human being until you started to have some experiences that, you know, with the Course, with the Course of Miracles when it came into her life and she was guided too by Jesus to read the Course, not in her first language, Icelandic, not in her second language, Danish, but in her third language. <laughs> she was guided to study the Course in Miracles in English, which you, you said you had to keep every page she had to run to the dictionary just to look up the words. But that was another guidance came from Spirit. Study this book in English. Now it makes more sense in retrospect, <laughs> because we're here and you're talking in English. We're doing this whole retreat in English. But at the time, you can imagine being guided to study a book this thick in your third language. That was a big leap. 
And each of us have had to go through those kind of things which seem like a pretty big leap in our lives. You know, for you, letting go of your career, letting go of your husband, and really letting go of everything that seemed to be your world was, a lot of people would say, those are huge leaps. But because you were, I think, living in such a prayerful state, and she had such a passion for happiness, <laughs> that those huge leaps, like leaping over a canyon, didn't seem so huge. When you have the happiness as your goal, when really you start to realize, I want the happiness and I'll do exactly and whatever it takes to do this. So, I, I think you've always said that a lot of those things that seem to be like major steps in the world that people can't even fathom, but for you, they came just at the point where you felt like, really you had no other decision if you were going to keep going for happiness. Yeah. No choice. No choice. Yes. It's almost, it's almost, you could say, almost scientific that once you start to, to get into the mind and you start to realize that everything that you perceive, and even the decisions you seem to make as a human being, like, have, like you have free choice in this world to make decisions, that those are part of a program condition, like the matrix, where there's this unconscious mind that is moving around the characters, and everybody who thinks they have complete freedom to do whatever they want as a human being, is part of a pre-program package that's based on belief. In fact, in A Course in Miracles it says, a decision is a conclusion based on everything that you believe. So even when you decide to eat something for dinner, when you decide to take a walk, when you decide to get married, get divorced, have children, not have children, all the things that seem to be part of a human being's free will and free choice, are part of reflections of unconscious beliefs. They're just conclusions based on these beliefs. And then the more you look at that, it starts to feel more like the matrix. The world starts to look like, wow, it's all just pre-programmed based on these unconscious beliefs, then I need to get down and I need to get in touch with my unconscious mind. I don't want to be at the mercy of these beliefs of time and space at these beliefs in scarcity, the beliefs in survival, all the things that seem to be accepted as natural as part of the human condition are a series, a system of, of beliefs that are mostly unconscious. That's, I think, why we, we use movies so much, that's why we use the music, that's why we have these long expression sessions. We've had expression sessions in our community for years I remember some days going to the monastery in the morning and we would just talk and we would have expression sessions all morning, have a bite to eat all evening and then sometimes in the early evening everybody's like just about expressioned out, like everybody's <laughs> done this and we would all say, we would all agree, okay, that's it, let's call it a day. And just when we were all leaving, someone would say, wait a minute, <laughs> I've got more. We all went, oh, <laughs> you know, after like a whole day of expressing. And sometimes I would have to even say to everybody, I said, listen, if, if we don't cut this off, if we don't m decide together about certain things, it's going to go down and downhill. We cannot function without making decisions around food, without making decisions, practical daily decisions. We were going for this uncovering, this total cleansing, this purification, but we have to be practical, so we have to agree to certain things. We also took more the route of not only expression sessions, but like the, like the Essenes from many, many years ago, back at the time of Jesus. Like the Franciscans, like Jesus and the Apostles, you know, we, we question things like personal ownership, we, we question things like, uh, you were talking about marriage, we really looked at relationships so deeply, like, what is the purpose for the relationship? The purpose became so important, 
because it wasn't just a purpose for one partner, but it was our purpose with everyone, with all of us in the community and with everyone beyond the community. So we started asking that question, you mentioned, what is it for, with everything. And to me, that's how I think I got toward the Course, was I, even when I was in university, I would take long walks in this park next to the university, and I would just start praying and talking and saying, yeah, why am I spending 10 years in university? And the Spirit was like, yeah, that's a good question. What exactly are you up to with this all this education? What, what do you believe you're doing it for? Well, I'm doing it because because of the degrees. I want the degrees. And what's why are degrees so important? Well, because they can get me a job and it's part of a career strategy. You know, I would tell back and forth with the spirit, you know, it's a career, it's a career. Why do you think a career is helpful? Because I don't want to be flipping burgers at McDonald's for 25 years, for Christ's sake. And it's like, yes, for Christ's sake. Well, what is underneath What's so bad about flipping burgers at McDonald's? What, why do you have such a judgment of that thing? Well, I, I need better jobs, wives, because I want a good relationship, and you can't be poor and have a good relationship. You know, that was another thing. Oh, you can't be poor and have a good relationship. You know, the Spirit would like come back with these things. Oh, you believe that? You believe you have to have money to have a good relationship? Yes, that's what I believe. And then, and why do you want a relationship even? Why is that important to you? Well, for intimacy. Well, at the end it was like the Spirit was saying, you are entitled to freedom, you are entitled to happiness, you are entitled to intimacy, you are entitled to connectedness, and you're going about it completely in the wrong way. You are going about it through time and space, and you have all these beliefs that tell you, you will be intimate, connected, whole, complete, abundant, all these things, free, happy, uh, if you achieve, accomplish, you know, all these things in time and space. And the Spirit was saying, no, that's your birthright. You, you are created with all of that. Now you've tossed that away and you've got some amnesia going on and some dream where you're trying to get all these things that you think you lost through it said external means, using the images to get these things. So I think that's like the underpinning that we, we can all talk about our lives of how as soon as we got this clarity that we were entitled to all those things that everybody wants, deep down, happiness, care, intimacy, freedom, but we were using egoic um, externals to try to achieve those states of mind, or that state of mind, once we kind of got to that point where we realized, oh, it's not that direction, then we did a 360 turnabout, you might say, in our mind, to the kingdom of heaven is within. And what does that even mean? You know, we had to really discover, what is in, within what? Is it within my body? No. <laughs> that's, that's not the within. It's, it's been a journey. It's been a real journey. But, you know, David, I love when you say that, because you show that, that uh, to do this, this process is not a walk in the park, okay? <clears throat> so, you, you know, it takes, it takes a lot of good. It started for me after the and, walk in the park. Right? <laughs> it started with the walk in the park, but then that was just a tiny piece. <laughs> yeah. Right, but, you know, and then you, you, you even have the, the experience of going to the woods, to stay in the woods for five years, you know, breaking woods, uh, whatever you did, uh, alone, alone, uh, you know, in, in the, so it's not a walk in the park. What I, you know, when you see other, other guys that go to the, to the you know, to, to uh, be a spiritual leader, and he says, well, you know what, go to the present moment. Go to the present moment and stay there, okay? That's not going to do it, okay? You tried that? You <laughs> tried it? Of course. Of course. <laughs> no way. Anyway, it. And, and then, you know, you know, Eckhart says that because he didn't have to, to go through the process that you did. He woke, he woke up overnight. So, he didn't have the experience. You haven't found that park bench? <laughs> <laughs> so, he did you know, it I love to say the way that you put it 
because you show to everybody that this is a is a is a, it's a tough process. It's it's achievable. You know you can get there. You know the course helps quite a bit. You know you to get there, but it's not a walk in the park. Okay. Pure and simple. I think Fernanda had her hand up. Now, but we have established it's not a walk in the. I was going to ask about how you develop the guidance because, like, I heard once David saying it starts started for you like with an urge or tickle. sparkle, a tickle in your heart, yes, and yes. then it developed until like you really hear mm -hmm. it. So, how was that yeah. for you, Francis? Yeah, our um, pathway seems a little different because David was pretty much he did the course on his own with the internal uh, voice um, from Jesus. But for, for myself, I came, um, you know, I pick up the course and everything, but I came to the monastery in the community to basically go through this work process with a lot of people. And um, I would say the first training, which was really important, is for me to learn how to follow. And that was a very um, interesting process because I came to the monastery and, you know, we, we use a lot of projects, different kind of projects as, as guided. And I, I didn't hear the guidance. So we basically came in and I was just plugging in and doing volunteer work. But because everything has the same purpose, we are just to practice, listen and follow to the to, to the guidance. So at first, I was seemingly follow someone external to me as a person. And it was very difficult to follow because I was thinking, why do I follow someone else? Like, I'm here to develop my inter internal relationship. I hate to, to listen to someone else. And their instruction doesn't make any sense. I don't trust them. But gradually, I realized wow, I just don't trust, period. Mm. You know, I, and then I give myself all the reasons why I don't trust, because this person is this, because that. But I don't have this habit to trust. I trust my own doubt thoughts. And I was very unhappy at the beginning because of this resistance and this just uh, determined to be right about my judgment about everybody. And there was... This one day, I was so, so unhappy, and I was there for like a, a month, and I was unhappy, and my friend at the time, JP, he, we were talking, and he said, why don't you just try it out today? Just say yes to everything. Just say yes to everything. So I said, but she doesn't give me the right task. She, 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 this, this is my leader, and... So I thought, okay, I have had enough suffering for this long, and I haven't really seemed to go anywhere. So today, before she opened her mouth, is a yes. is a yes from my heart. And I did, and I was so happy that day. It was the first glimpse of that happiness can be at my own choice. It's not dependent. It was my first glimpse. And after that, I thought, okay, if I know this, I can say yes, I know what it means to follow now. I know what to follow. It's not just about external person, but it's about a willingness to not judge and to not doubt. So that was the kind of the beginning of developing a trusting state of mind. You know, A Course in Miracles is very much saying that we want to have trust. Yes. So it starts with a willingness and then developing trust. Yeah. Right? Yes. For me, it, was, it, it seems like we use each other to practice this, this habit of trust because I grew up, I didn't trust anybody. I trust myself, I trust my ability, I trust my own judgments and maybe people close to me that I develop trust. But to say that you can actually have trust Trust the spirit was so far from me because I, I can't see the spirit. What is that, right? So let's trust, first and foremost, this direction that is given to you. Can you do that? And that was a training. And then It's great that it's a decision, too, because you're talking about the monastery. But I remember I was down in Sydney, and 
you you said that Jason and I could come to your house. Yeah. And so I remember coming over, and I was I was there in Francis's house, and Jason was there, and then I remember sitting there, and then there was something talk you two talking about you needed to go out to buy some groceries, and so then they disappeared. They went off to the grocery store. I'm just in Francis's house, and off she goes with Jason. And then when they came back, they had a lot to share because a lot happened in that grocery store. Before she came to the monastery, there was there was an interaction between you and Jason where the topic of trust came up right there at the grocery store. And, and it really points to me how it's a decision, you know, because it's like, you know, she's going along living her life and she's feeling kind of entrapped and entangled in the world. Then they go off to buy some groceries and they come back and they've just got this big smile on their faces. And I'm like, what happened there? You get some groceries? Yeah. But more than that, they, they had an encounter in the grocery store. Yeah, and also right before that, I was in your retreat and I, I had a lot of doubt thoughts. That's where like, I just doubt everything. And, and then I had a one-on-one -on -one with David. I asked, why is this? Why, why do you say this? Why, is it? why, why, why? A lot of questions. And David was very patient answering all my questions. Then I heard a voice saying that um, he is the living representation of me you can just trust him and the voice is is audible so i'm like who is talking right here i was looking around and i, I thought was, well i was talking too i was talking to her and then she has this voice in her mind talking to her while i'm talking but to it her. felt like an external <laughs> voice so i was looking around i thought who is talking to me and then i would look at david he was still going and going answering my question and i thought wow so after that experience, when I was with Jason, I said to Jason in the grocery store, I said, this is what, is this as simple as I just trust? Because that's what the voice told me to do, to just trust. Is this as simple? Can I just start by trusting David? Because I don't know what the spirit is. Let me just trust the one who is sent. And Jason said, yes, that's, that's as how it starts. Basically, mm -hmm. and that's the voice when you hear the guidance. That's the voice you hear, or it, it varies. Sometimes it can be a symbol. It can be. Yeah, I I I don't really hear an audible voice mm -hmm. anymore after the first couple of times. So guidance comes now more in all kinds of ways. Maybe yeah. Yeah, yes. in external science. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have a question as well. So. Basically, what you're saying is that, like, it's, it's a path to happiness, right? So, like, letting go of some things and our day by day and stuff. But I get to question myself, so isn't it possible, then, to be happy flipping burgers at McDonald's? Or isn't it happy to... Isn't it possible to be happy at a university or with a job or, or anything else? Because... Otherwise, what you're actually saying is a step-by-step -step or a path not only to happiness but to destroy our society because otherwise it would be like everybody would be at the monastery. So how would it would be possible to like have like, I don't know, everything we're using here, technology, science and everything. So how does yeah. it go? Yeah, the happiness obviously doesn't come from the action because what you do comes from what you think. So if you thought like of your body is more like a puppet or a marionette, and then you have like a crossbow and then there's somebody up there moving it, and the, the words that come and the actions that come, you know, this is how the mind works. It takes a while to, to discover it, but once you do, you realize that actions are effects. They, they're coming from thoughts in the mind. And so what you do comes from what you think. And therefore, if your thinking's messed up, the actions are going to be inconsistent. We know how that is with the human condition. We say one thing, we do another. We say, what happened? I changed my mind. I changed my mind five times. <laughs> well, that's not very consistent. Well, that's just the way I am. I'm a liberty chip and I change, <laughs> I change my mind all the time. So, so what you're asking is, can you be happy flipping burgers at McDonald's, for example, 
if you're guided, in other words, the Spirit's going to guide you intuitively to meet needs. You still, while you believe you're a human being, you still have needs. Why do, you know, people just don't go and flip burgers at McDonald's because they're happy. I, oh, I want to just flip burgers and I'll get all my joy in life from flipping these burgers. They do like when they get the paycheck. And the paycheck does seem to serve some things. But that's part of just, if you follow the guidance, and you keep following the guidance, you'll, you will see many scenarios, you will see many things that happen. But as you continue to follow the guidance more consistently, like what the Spirit is telling you, like to take you out of the labyrinth and the maze, you, you have to follow whatever it is. Get a job at McDonald's, you know, you have to do some of that. In Jeffrey's case, it was getting married. He, you know, here's Susanna, you're, you're supposed to marry her. Well, Susanna, prior to that, was, had said, I'm, I'm, I don't ever want to get married in this lifetime. And Jeffrey wasn't interested in it, but there was some strong guidance that was like, this will be very helpful for your mind. This partnership will be used in many, many helpful ways. So it could be a job at McDonald's, it could be getting married, it could be a lot of different things. But the happiness comes from following. That's what you were just saying, listen and follow. And you do have to have trust to like hand over the reins and say, I'm not going to be the one who, who thinks I can figure out this world or thinks I know already what's best. I need help. You know, that's like even in 12-step programs, you know, you have to you have to admit you have a problem, a drinking problem, an alcohol problem, a sex addiction problem, and then you have to be willing to open up to a higher power. Call it whatever you want. Intuition, God, call it anything you want. But there's a, there's a surrender process of, I need help. So the happiness doesn't come from the action, but the happiness does come from listening and following. So, and then you're wondering, because you asked that question, and there are people that I know have been studying on the journey for decades, their spiritual journey, and they said, wait a minute, if everybody follows this guidance, what's going to happen to society? What's going to happen to our jobs, our careers and everything? I had one friend who, who uh, he was a, a, an art history, an art professor at a university, but he was very cold and harsh and he treated his wife terribly, like a trophy wife, and he was just mean. He's just a mean guy. And then he was over in Paris at the Louvre showing his art students, you know, a tour through there. And suddenly he went through what's called a near-death experience where all this acid started, you know, his stomach was filled with acid from all this negativity and anger and darkness. It just started eating up his intestines. They rushed him to the hospital and they opened him up and they tried to do surgery on him and it was such a bad thing going on with his intestines that he was fading in and out of consciousness and at one point they were just like, they were like, this is, no we can't do it. It was on a holiday weekend, we can't, we can't, we can't handle this here. So they airlifted him across the Atlantic Ocean back to the United States to do more operations on him. He had this long near-death experience where he went up into the light and he saw life reviews and all these things happened and then he was with this one being, he remembered when he was growing up, he didn't believe in God, he didn't believe in Jesus, he didn't believe, but he remembered these nuns that, that had taught him this song when he was a little boy. Uh, he's having all these flashes and memories. The Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. He's remembering he's a kid and these nuns are singing these songs. He's in this thing for hours and hours and hours. And finally he gets taken by, by this being that he says it was Jesus who took him way into this giant constellation of light. And it was so much love and so much light that he was in this experience and he said, Stop! Stop! I can't, I can't get any closer, I can't go there. And Jesus looked at him and he, and he said to Jesus, he said, I can't go any further. I, I don't belong here. I'm not worthy of that love. 
I'm not, I don't belong by that light. And then the Jesus figure said, yes you do. As he was being held by this light. Meanwhile, he goes through this whole long experience, starting over in France, Paris, back over the United States, and it, he seems to have been in this near-death experience for many, many hours. When he finally comes out of it, he's in a hospital room, he's been operated on a couple times, and he feels this exploding joy, just exploding joy and happiness. And he feels so much joy that he's like blowing kisses to the doctors, he's blowing <laughs> kisses to the nurses. He's got more joy after this whole experience, then he knows what to do with it. It's just like he's totally changed. He's just, he's gone from being an atheist, bitter, angry, angry man into this love bomb. So he's in the hospital, I love you, he's saying to the nurses, I love you, you know everything. His wife comes to visit and she's in the room for only five minutes and she comes running out of the room and she's like, what have you done to my husband? He's gone through this massive, we'll call them NDEs, near-death experience, where psychically, in his mind, he's gone through such a change that she was scared. She thought it was like some kind of a, a different spirit or something <laughs> like a different soul got into his body. She was freaked. Uh, she got out of there pretty quick. And okay. then it changed his whole life. I mean, this, this was such a profound experience that basically he ended up leaving his profession in, in the northern Kentucky uh, as an art teacher and eventually he went to seminary and eventually he, he went through some a couple years of seminary and studying to be a minister and he ended up writing a book going on Oprah Winfrey show back in the day and he ended up at my parents church as the minister and I, I had read about this guy and I was following, I was kind of opening my mind reading about NDEs and then my mom came home one day and she said, oh we we hired a new minister. I said, who's the minister now? And they, he, they said, Howard Storm was his name. And I said, Howard Storm? I knew the whole thing that he meant to and now he's, he's a minister at the church that I was raised at, United Church of Christ. I'm like, and Jesus is telling me, yep, yeah, this is your mind. Now that that angry professor is now the minister at your church. You haven't been back there for a while, but that's who I've got as the pastor at your church. I'm like, oh, that church is changing fast. And he's like, your mind is changing fast. All of the, everything we perceive is just a reflection of our mind. Now, when he was in this long near-death experience, he was taken centuries into the future, and at one point, he was shown Earth, and it was so different than it is now, because guess what? The supermarkets were gone, the corporations were gone, a lot of the people were gone. He, he was given, like in the Akashic Records, a, a vision of Earth centuries into the future. And he had the same questions you were asking. What happened? Where did, what was it, like a bomb? Or what, why? Why are things so different than they were when, as I experienced Earth? This is a whole different Earth. I think Eckert wrote a book, The New Earth. This was really New Earth. And, and Jesus said, well, the mind has evolved and spiritually evolved to the point. And so Howard, he just started asking all these questions like, well, first of all, like, there's no grocery stores. What do people, and there's no restaurants. Like, what do people eat? You know, these you can imagine seeing a future version and, and wondering basic questions. What do people eat? And Jesus said, well, they, the people at this stage of development don't really get hungry very often at all. And when they do get hungry, they don't need to grow food in the earth for the food. They just carry a little sack, they have a little strap around their waist with a little sack of seeds. And they hardly ever get hungry, but when they do get hungry, they pull out a few seeds, and then they use the power of their mind to germinate the seeds, and then they eat. And then they don't think about it for a long time until they have to again. And Howard was like, oh my 
God, what year is this? <laughs> you know, but he was given life reviews. He was given angels. He was because he was an art history teacher. They showed him colors that don't even exist on Earth. He was like they showed him these spectacular colors, and being an art history teacher, you know, he loved art, and he loved the colors. But he was like, whoa, what is this? Like when we first watched that movie, what was the one where the Avatar? Remember when you that beautiful Adima's music in the background, and then any of you saw Avatar, it was like you could see it 3D, the glasses, and we we're all in the theater like, whoa, what is this? This is. I like this realm, whatever this avatar realm is. What we perceive as perception is just again, it's a motion picture of our consciousness. And as soon as we have these miracles and these shifts in consciousness, we see everything different. And in the end, the society is a projection of our mind. The people are projections of our mind. The way that we seem to do things with uh, Mike was asking about the racial issues, the inequality issues, and everything. All of that is again a projection of our mind. We're, we're perceiving what we believe, and we have to start to change the way we believe. Now, I can tell you, for me, at the beginning, when I got into the course, I was just like I had that tickle that Fernanda's talking about. I had a little tickle in my heart. And I would watch certain movies or read certain books, and the tickle would go. I would open up a Wayne Dyer book, and, I, and I'd be reading, and whoo, whoo, whoo. I have to stop. I have to put the book down. Mm -hmm. Wayne, wow, what are you talking about here? Whoo, 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 whoo. We, we've had those experiences. You read Wayne Dyer's, even the early books, Heronia Zones, or when you believe it, you'll see it, and you know, there's a whole group of them. And then I watched certain movies, I'd listen to certain people talk, the tickle would go. And then years went by, and then finally I was out in California at a humanistic psychology conference, and The Course in Miracles came into my hand. And this is just another book to me, but I, I opened it up, and all of a sudden the tickle, it just went so strong. And then it was like, like, oh my gosh, what is this? What is this book? Because the tickle was going so strong. Then I felt like a tsunami of love just washing over me. And I could hear in my mind the, the idea, you will never be the same again. Mm. Like, almost like in Star Trek, you know, where they say, beam me up. Like, like all of a sudden you've been walking around as a human being and all of a sudden you get under this huge light and you know that your whole life will never be anything like you thought it would be. It's like it's that profound. Like you're going in a trajectory. I didn't really know, know where I was going. I was lost, like most people, you know, wandering in the dark. But, but suddenly it just came on so strong. And that was 30, 33 years ago. So. What happened was, it wasn't just studying the Course, but it was for me, a, it's all down to practical application, you know. It's not theology. We've had all these religions for many centuries. Jesus even said, love your neighbor as yourself. We've been trying that. <laughs> We've been practicing with our relationships and our neighbors, lots of neighbors. But it's not so easy. He says, forgive and be forgiven. Yeah, well, maybe I need more instruction and practice in this forgive word, because you know, it's a hard, like, it's no uh, walk in the park when you say the words, I forgive you, if you don't mean it in your heart, then there's still a grievance there. You still have something to face. So the more I got into the miracles, the more it was like, Jesus is like, well, yeah, all those years of university, whatever you learned, he said, I can use that. Uh, whatever vocabulary you have, I can use that. I wasn't wealthy, I didn't have a lot of possessions, but I did say at that point, I give you my body, I give you my mind, I give you my heart, I give you everything in my world to use for your purposes, for the awakening of everyone. And that was when the miracles like really accelerated, because it was a big surrender moment. I just thought, I don't know the way, I'm lost. After 10 years of university, I wasn't, didn't have any clear ideas of how I could serve and be happy. You know, I, I learned a lot of 
what I thought was not the way, but I wasn't really into the tractor beam of, of the way, the truth, and the life, it's called. I, I was not in that. So, if you give yourself over to it, yes, the, the world that you perceive will disappear. That's, that's where this is heading. It, you will, it, it's a veil drawn over the light that we are. We are pure light being. We are not perceptual. We are spiritual. We are eternal beings. And these little flesh suits are not even close to who we are. And then, as I gave myself over and over, I started, you know, like in a lot of traditions, they have meditations. I had a friend of mine where we would just sit across from each other, a little closer than Fernanda and I are, and we would go into these deep, like open-eyed meditations where we would just be gazing silently into each other's eyes for I don't know how long. We wouldn't even keep track of the time. We would just gaze. And the first time we, we did this in a very deep way, we were in the woods in, in Kentucky very much like this setting, we, were, we took a table and two chairs out into the thick woods. It was so thick you could barely even see sunlight uh, coming through the trees. It was so thick woods. And we sat out there for I don't know how long just gazing into each other's eyes. And then the whole world went, went from three-dimensional to two-dimensional in my perception. And then this blazing light not like sunlight, but this spiritual light came th through, and the whole world disappeared. Uh, it was a revelatory experience where I just went so deep in my mind with such stillness that the whole world disappeared. Then we did it again. We went out onto a lake. We were in a rowboat. We put the oars down. We sat on the we sat on the seats of the boat, and we let the wind blow the boat, and we lost track of time again doing these open-eyed meditation together, and then the whole world again disappeared for me. I just went into pure light, where I felt complete love and oneness, and, and, and then it happened a third time when we did it again at a friend of ours, and he wasn't there, but he, he had his, the key we could just get in. We went there, we sat at his kitchen table, we did the same thing. It was, I had three revelatory experiences in which, in each case, the world disappeared. Also with that, my questions like you're asking, what will happen to society? That disappeared. Mm -hmm. What will happen to mankind, to men and women? That disappeared. I was actually shown the end of where all of spiritual awakening goes to, which is light, just eternal light. But not the kind of light, the, the body's eyes, like a physical sense of, of light, or the kind of light that Einstein talked about the physical universe and, and things moving at the speed of light, everything. Not that either, but it was just, it was a, a light beyond the dream, beyond the dream. And I have to say that the, those were very convincing experiences for me. You know, the, the attractions of the world lost, the, they were weakened in those light revelatory experiences. It was a bit frightening coming back actually, from that light to this world. It was a, like a shock to the system, almost like, you know, you, the defibrillators came, except this was like a spiritual defibrillator waking me up to ultimate reality and then coming back. We talked about uh, ayahuasca, you know, down here in Peru and down in Brazil and everything, people do have psychedelic experiences Sometimes some of them are very perceptual, but sometimes they may have something that that goes into the light, like a revelatory experience, and that will rock your world. That's why people who who have one of those psychedelic experiences, they usually recommend taking like a month or two afterwards and not doing anything, uh, not trying to do anything structured, because your mind has to to integrate it. Even Eckert that you mentioned, you know, when he had his park bench experience over there in England, it was so radical that he had to take a period of weeks and months before he could even move and talk and function again. Because the light is so different than this perceptual world. It's like there's not 
there's not a meeting point the between park bench. Yeah, park. he was he was on the park bench for a while. Yeah, he literally was. He'd say the walk in the park. He he was <laughs> sat down in the park to try to to integrate what he had just gone through. So ultimately, that's that's the bigger context for everything that we perceive, including society, including the careers and the jobs and everything that's going on in this world, is part of a, a veil, almost like a veil drawn over the truth of, of pure love and light. That's the bigger context. And as I've gone along, though over these last 33 years, there's so many miracles that involve interpersonal relationships where you come together and you, you are used together in these beautiful collaborations. Imagine like if you were a symphony player and you had this great ability to play the violin or the oboe or the cello or something and then you not only were in a giant orchestra playing your instrument but you let go of the one that was playing the instrument. You, you merged into this giant harmony where everything was just perfect and, and you weren't doing anything, you weren't even playing the instrument. And many of us have those experiences where they're kind of like merge experiences where we are just so relaxed and so happy that we have this beautiful experience and we go, wow, I wish it could always be the way it is right now. And that's because we're touching upon a, a miracle. We're touching upon a miracle. The book that we have studied, Jeffrey's worked 12 steps, so he's come from from addiction through the 12 steps, and then the course now is just kind of merged. It's like a continuation of, uh, of 12 step programs. Far beyond addictive behaviors, this is like purification in the mind, taking you higher and higher into states of mind. They curse a lot of love? Uh, this was the program, the, the Course in Miracles, is the name. Yeah, Course in Miracles. And he was using the 12-step program, but it's taken him higher and higher. The Course of Love is not the same uh, metaphysics as the Course. But actually, it's been so beautiful because when you give yourself more and more over to miracle working, you could call it, it's... It, even the word miracle working can seem to have religious kind of connotations to it. And I certainly, you know, was raised Christian, but I, my parents were not telling me, you know, dinner and breakfast, you know, David, you'll grow up to be a miracle worker, you know, mm -hmm. the farthest thing from that, you know. But the more you actually start to give yourself over to this guidance, to this alignment, then miraculous things happen and and I could not I could fill hundreds of books if I tried to write down all the miraculous experiences I've had in the last 33 years since the course came into my life it's just I mean the travels the meditations the revelatory experiences there's just no way to put it in a, in a in a single book or in a single movie or whatever but it's I see it's all been convincing for me to give myself over to what's real and true and to let go of pursuing false ideas and false concepts of identity. It's like we want to come back into our true identity, which is spiritual identity. So that's the short version. I gave a little we, we did a weekend retreat in Sedona, Arizona, and we got through the whole retreat, and there was, we're saying, there's a, there's a few minutes left, one more question, and then at the, the at the end of the retreat, this woman goes, I'm brand new, could you tell me why would we do this in the first place if we were all so perfect? And I, let me, so I gave like a, a five minute answer. The next day she writes on Facebook, I was just in a wonderful weekend retreat with David Hoffmeister, who wrote A Course in Miracles. <laughs> so I, gave, I said, well, in the ultimate sense, but uh, not in, the, in this realm. But what it is, is it's very, very profound, but 
But the most important thing is not to try to understand the book. It's just what we talked about at the very beginning, to have the willingness, the eagerness, you know, the openness to just say, there must be a better way than the way that I've been going. Like with Olivia, you know, you have a career, and then all of a sudden you get this little inner oh my God. prompting. Oh. Yeah. I'm asking for Jesus. Now, yes. if I were to ask something, and this is the answer. Mm -hmm. This is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just said my name. Yes, that's it. This is it. This is it. This is how it works. We are so loved that when we have we have a little prayer in our mind, we just have the little slightest prayer of the, like Francis was saying, that show me that, okay, all right, I want to be happy. You know, it can be a, that can be the prayer. Please, I want to be happy. And then we've tried so many things. We've tried careers. We maybe even were successful in the things we've done. It doesn't even matter. Somewhere, some way, there's something inside of us that that knows that, that we have we have a calling, we have a, a, a destiny, we have a purpose um, that, so that we can we can give ourselves over to. It. That's that's why we do this. You know, we we have this. I don't know if I uh, I was uh, trying to say something now, but I don't know if my ego or not. And I asked to Jesus, uh, give me a sign. <laughs> Just <laughs> said my name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> That's the fast track. Right? Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, I've been following my inner voice for three years. And I've, I'm feeling guided. I'm feeling really happy. I'm, I'm following my purpose, and uh, if I think about uh, in the matrix achievement, I have a lot to do. I'm 36 years old, and live with my mom. Um, I, I want to be married. I want to have children. I have a lot. I have a. I, I have a lot to do, but I'm really happy now. I'm really, really happy. But there is one thing that I want to know about you, about your journey, and about your guidance. When I feel this, in the same way, I feel the arrogance. I feel superior. <clears throat> and when I realize that I'm feeling superior, I'm feeling that I'm ridiculous. Are you understanding? Yeah, like, yeah. have you ever feel this? Like, I'm feeling so blessed that I'm, um, that I'm, that I have been guided, and I'm feeling so happy that I feel that I'm superior. And when when I realize this, I feel ridiculous. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. The ego is is quite ingenious. So it has all kinds of tactics to quickly try to turn something, even like feelings of love or happiness, it will quite try to turn them against you in the quickest way possible. Because when people start to feel happy and they start to feel this love and joy, then the ego feels very threatened. Like, oh no, no, please stop, do not keep going in this direction. So it tries to use the superior, inferior thing. But it's always a, a personal interpretation. In other words, we have to come to this state of mind where we realize that we're all connected. So, if you feel happy, it's not at the expense of other people. It's not, the ego tries to pull the comparison thing, like, oh yeah, great, Olivia, oh you're happy, yeah, yeah, but, it always comes in with the but, and then it will point to unhappy people, it will point to others and will say, but they're so less fortunate than you, and you are arrogant to think that you can really be happy. You see how it, it comes rushing in to try to guard against the whole awakening. It's very clever at doing this. It always uses comparison as the, as the main uh, defense. 
comparing with other people. But imagine that really there's only one of us. Imagine that we're all, as we were created, as we're all part of one being, and that the trick has been that we're separate. The trick has been that we have our own private bodies, with our own private minds, with our own private thoughts and our private feelings. And then no one seems happy in this world of division and competition and comparison and privacy. It's because the ego set this up to keep us from knowing who we are. This is like a giant defense against the reality of who we are. So you might say, having believed we've fallen asleep, now the ego tries to make the dream real and also, even if you get glimmers of happiness, it will come in. It doesn't mind when you're angry, sad, depressed, it's quite, it'll stay back like a spider in the cobweb. It stays back in the web. But when you get happy, when you start to have happy feelings, it comes forward with a whole scheme of things to try to tempt you and say, stop this. You, you cannot be experiencing... But sometimes I am arrogant. Yeah. I know but, that I am. But we'll say that that's the ego the ego that you still believe in, that aspect of your mind. Whenever you give belief to something, then you feel its feelings. So the ego is an arrogant thought, the belief that it can edge God out, it can, it can take the place of spirit. That's very arrogant. And to the extent that you still believe in it, then you feel its feelings. But they're not your real feelings. They are not your real feelings. So you don't have to beat yourself up, you don't have to be self-critical of that because you're just experiencing its feelings. And then its whole purpose is to have you stay identified with it. So we're told in the Course, he says, you made the ego by believing in it, and you can dispel the ego by withdrawing your belief from it. So. It's good that you have these, you've taken some major steps following your guidance for the last three years. The more you do that, the more disturbed the ego is, because it's like, oh no, no. Like the movie The Wizard of Oz, you know, as soon as Dorothy's on her journey with her mighty companions, trying to go see the wizard and get back home to camp, to uh, Kansas. <laughs> Kansas. <laughs> we have a center in Kansas. <laughs> When she goes on this journey, you know, there's the ego, the closer she gets there, the, there's the Wicked Witch of the West, there's flying monkeys, there's all these obstacles that come to stop her from remembering her true home. And it's very similar to this journey. When you start to awaken, the ego tries to throw all these criticisms, you're doing it wrong, how dare you think this, who do you think you are? You know, you can tell by its tone of voice that it's, it's very threatened. And sometimes it's not the ego trying to take credit for it, like, yeah. oh, you're happy, yeah. that was me. Just, the ego will yeah. try to, uh, to join like in yeah. somehow and come up with a spiritual self-concept, where it's very much about being superior to others, and that doesn't have any humility in it, there's no equality, it's not true, genuine love when the ego tries to do that. But that's why in one sense, that's why we, when we join together, we're like all mighty companions helping each other on this awakening journey. That's where you, you may have had a biological family, you may have had uh, friends in this world, but as you go deeper on the spiritual journey, then the Spirit will send you reflections and witnesses that help you on the awakening journey. And we've all experienced that, where we've had grown up and we've had friends and people that have been in our life, but, but a lot of it was just based on our preferences. You know, we, we preferred this, and then we witnessed these kind of friends. Maybe they were into bigger, better, faster, more, or maybe they were into things of the world, because our, our investment in the ego brought them forth. But now we get a whole new, we get new sets of witnesses that help us along the way. And it does get easier, you know, it's, it, it's the first steps of the journey, like you're talking about, of these first three years when you turned away from what seemed to be your 
destiny in this world and you, t you turned more on this inward journey, that's the hardest part. The hardest part is the beginning. So does it get easier? <laughs> yes, it gets. It's a pleasant feeling to, to hear that because it feel like when you transcend some of these beliefs, then you're like, okay, like because you come to a mindset where you're, wait, where you're waiting for the next, right? You're like, you know, kind of welcoming these things because then yeah. they are helping you, right? Yeah. Sometimes it's heavy, right? And when yeah. you come out of a long period of that, and there's one thing, is like, okay, and then the next thing, the same belief is just bigger. You're like, whoa, okay. Let me take on this one. Yeah. And then sometimes it's tiring. It's yeah, tiring. It's, it's, it just seems <laughs> it does it does seem like you have to walk through some some darkness. In other words, the how are we doing? Three time? minutes to dinner. Five Three minutes. minutes. Five, five minutes to dinner. Uh, it seems like honestly I'll tell you that this is a journey where you seem to have to go through the darkness to the light. So, a lot of times affirmations and just trying to always call in the positive without really looking at and exposing the darkness, it's, it's like putting sweet icing on a cake of mud. You know, that's what affirmations I say are like, they, they have their benefit, but then when you're just putting the sweet icing on a cake of mud and you dig down in the cake, your finger comes up with all this mud, then you go, oh my gosh, what did I gloss over? Here, what was I avoiding? But the good news is, is that the more intuitive you become and the more you learn how to pray and align and make decisions with the Spirit, which unwinds your mind from the ego, it gets easier and easier and lighter and lighter. And then there's one point where there's a line in the Course that says, when you have learned how to decide with God, all decisions become as easy and as right as breathing, and it will be as if you are carried down a quiet path in summer. It's just one of these, oh, thank you for telling me that it can be gentle, it can be easy. But also, that's why I was saying with Olivia, that's why we are, we are joined in this purpose, because we, we do need lots of support when you're going through this darkness. My path was a little different in the sense that I got the course in 86 and it was early on and, and like Francis was saying, I basically was just doing the course on my own. And it took me about three years, I was using the course as an oracle, I was praying and popping the book open and getting all kinds of answers with the book and then with other books and many different and movies and music and all kinds of things. But mine was more of a of an individual journey. Not so with our community. I mean, we, we have refined and been given so many tools that, for example, some of you may enjoy watching movies. So, the Spirit gave us the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. So, this is something that is very popular now because people love movies and there's so much spiritual commentary. And then there's another thing called Spreaker, which there's an app. So Luis is, well, you've been jet-setting around the world with your Spreaker app and, and listening to a, quite a few hours. Jet-setting around, listening while he's doing his business and jet-setting around, he's listening to these ideas, watching the movies. I guess you've probably watched a lot of it. Yeah, I have watched probably the top 50. The top 50 movies. But there are a lot of tools, so my path was more of kind of a, a very individualized, but I did have, have Jesus inside telling me what to do, where to go. You know, once, after about three and a half years, I had Jesus as kind of almost like a little bird on my shoulder. Call so-and-so, now, do it now. Like the Matrix, turn left. No, your other left. Okay, all right, I missed that one. You know, it's, it's, the, it's like a little chirping bird kind of saying, here, I can guide you like the Matrix, but you must do exactly as I say. The more I just followed, trust, listen, follow that inner voice, then everything came to me. And then I met all these people and we, you know, we joined together in a very strong way. That's why there was a monastery 
It's the first Course in Miracles, I think maybe the only Course in Miracles monastery, monastery in the world. But the experiences that Francis was sharing, or we had centers in yeah, Mexico and the United States and... There's the bell. Yeah. <laughs> the bee is saying, you've, you've run out of time and they're hey. cooking your meal hey. right now. David, uh, last question, quick, quick question. Do you still feel like Do you feel like question uh, to see if it's a quick answer? <laughs> do you feel like uh, are you still learning or you know like good question? <laughs> this to me this is a happy dream. So the whole point of learning was to learn the happy dream. Mm -hmm. And and the happy dream he, he says the Holy Spirit needs happy learners to reach the happy dream. So I feel like that has been my journey, has been to be so willing and so, yeah, that's why there's a consistency in my experience, is because that's really the only lesson that can be learned, is the happy lesson, the happy dream. Everything else was like an impossible lesson. Yeah. <laughs> he's like saying, wrap it up, we've got the dinner time here, he said, ding, ding, ding. But it feels very, very consistent, very, very happy. And that's why, again, why we join together so much. We're all here to share it. We're here to share it and extend it. it really fully, you know, through the internet and through these kind of gatherings and retreats. Oh, he's ringing again. <laughs> okay, that's our sign. Thank you.